really excited to be here. It's the first time that my husband and son are at one of my conferences. This year, this September, we started traveling the world for a year. We're homeschooling, being digital nomads there, and doing community service as a family. So this is a stopover on the way to Sydney from Athens. And I'm also thrilled when I came in yesterday that all the organizers were in all black, because this is the best of my three outfits. <laughs> <clears throat> when I was eight years old, the Iranian revolution took place. It was 1979. The USSR, bordering Iran on the north, was a prominent political influence. And I became a self-declared communist. I wore camel pants. I slept on the floor of my bedroom in solidarity with poor children. And like any good communist, I was extremely serious. I'm the one with the chin, her <laughs> hand on her chin. I lived in northern Tehran, and I wanted to go to school in a, a nearby village that had the poor kids. And my mom, to her credit, allowed me to change schools. In the mornings, about 25 of us would leave our apartment building. All the other kids would go to the right. I would wave goodbye to my sister and would go left. The revolution didn't always belong to the mullahs. They stole, stole it. Here are a few Iranian women prior to the revolution. After the revolution, it became illegal for women and girls to show their hair. We were forced to cover. In response, I cut my hair and passed as a boy for as long as I could get away with it. Then when I was 16, one hot afternoon shopping with my family, I noticed that my headscarf was on backwards. I quickly lifted it and turned it around as I entered into a fabric store. The door of the store opened up again, and my heart sank. There were two men in uniform with mean, piercing eyes staring right at me. They were the moral police, the regime's task force with the mission of controlling people using religion as a tool. I ended, I ended up being arrested that day, and my mom refused to let her 16-year-old go alone, so they piled all of us into a van and took us in. I was nervous, so the best I could come up with was to pretend that I was really religious. I took a notebook and a pen, I asked for it, and I jotted down every word they were saying really frantically. They held me for five hours and only released me after I repented in writing. Next time they warned, I would receive 50 lashes. 30 years later, in the summer of 2009, we saw the biggest uprising since the revolution. The pre-election season was filled with excitement. Tens of thousands of Iranians were campaigning day and night for their reformist candidates. Then, the election was very quickly called for the conservative incumbent, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. You remember him? Remember when he was the worst guy around? <laughs> Most Iranians assumed a rigged election and the rallies turned into massive protests. The government of Iran, worried for its very existence, lashed out violently, killing the protesters in broad daylight in the streets. The world was watching, and so was I. In اینجا کجاست که کسی ما رو یاری نمی کنه اینجا کجاست که ما فقط با سکوت خودمون داریم صدامون رو گوش دنیا می رسیم اینجا کجاست که خونه جوانش ریخ نمشه و مردم تیخی یا قوایی می سن نماز می خونه That video, it broke my heart. All Iranians want is what all people want, to live their life, to reach their potential, 
to see their children happy. And instead of supporting them, the government was crushing the bodies, the mind, the spirit of its people. I decided I would organize a protest. I was hoping for maybe 30 rallies around the world. Hundreds of other concerned citizens joined in as organizers, and we organized within three weeks what we called the Global Day of Action. On July 25th, 2009, over 110,000 protesters joined hands in 110 cities around the world. Archbishop Desmond Tutu made a video message calling on concerned citizens to join us. Another eight, seven Nobel Peace laureates joined us, participated either on the streets or online. The band U2 in Dublin projected pictures of the protesters during the song Sunday Bloody Sunday. Protesters in more than 100 cities around the world are sending a single message to Iran's leaders. Free the protesters. As you can see, the only continent free of demonstrations today, Antarctica. The group United for Iran wants an end to the crackdown on people disputing Iran's controversial presidential election. For the people of Iran, that day is still the biggest day of solidarity in history. Shortly after I started United for Iran, where we work to improve civil liberties inside Iran. More than half of my colleagues were in the streets of Iran in 2009 and have first-hand experience with imprisonment, torture, and harassment. I have been called an anti-revolutionary fugitive by the Ministry of Intelligence, which I think is a pretty badass title I put on my business card. So we're not going back to Iran safely, unfortunately. And we work together to improve lives inside Iran from the outside. And how do we affect change from outside the country? Targeted civic technology is our answer. Through our incubator called Iran Cubator, we are currently supporting 10 communities of activists in building mobile apps to be used inside Iran to improve lives. And here's my team. Freedom of expression is one of the most important, critical rights for a working democracy. And it's one that's most trampled upon inside Iran. This is Abbas Hakim Zadeh, a prominent student rights activist, a dear friend. He left Iran after being tortured in prison for giving a speech at his university. He is the co-creator of the app Radito, which is similar to SoundCloud. Users um, subscribe to channels, and then the content of these range of channels is automatically downloaded on their app in one place conveniently when they're at home and they can listen to it on the go. And the content includes audiobooks, news, radio shows, podcasts, and so forth. Conversely, users can create their own channels to broadcast their message to the world, and the interface of the app is available in five languages. Our goal is not to build tech tools, but to empower leaders to improve lives and support movements inside Iran with technology. We build our apps not only for, but with our community members. The apps are the ideas of the leading activists that work on Iran, and we essentially empower them to connect, sustain, and scale their efforts. Shadi Sharifi is a family lawyer. She used to work in Kurdistan, Iran, and had cases after cases of women who were victims of domestic violence at the hands of their husbands. Most of these women were uneducated and didn't know the basics about their rights or about domestic violence. Simin has first-hand experience with harassment by a previous partner, and she has a law degree as well. They wanted to further support women in Iran who were victims of domestic violence, and through Iran Cubator, we supported them in building the app Toranj. Women in Iran surrender their rights when they get married. The right to education, to work, to travel, to divorce, to the custody of their children. Yet, marriage contracts are 
marriage licenses are contracts, and, if to get, uh, and they give both parties equal rights. If language is included in the contract that gives both parties equal rights, that's legally binding. So knowing that, we build an app for that. Torrent includes that strategy and that content. It also supports women who are in imminent danger. With the push of a button, they can share their GPS location with pre-selected individuals on the app or with the police. Sahar Shams was sexually molested by a close relative when she was a young girl. She built the app Mishka. Mishka addresses child sexual abuse in Iran, in a Muslim country, in a place where consensual adult sex is often challenging and taboo to talk about. The app is a tool for parents who want to protect their children but don't have the skills to talk about it. Mishka is a bug and her wings are her private parts and she's also the main character of a video game and an integrated audiobook. She has a flower that reflects how she's feeling. In one of the stories, someone touches her wings and she doesn't address it and her flower starts wilting. Sahar invited the users to draw their flowers. And here's what we got. This is Ali and he's nine from Karaj. And here's what he said makes his flower happy. Not going to school. <laughs> Waking up in the morning and there being no school. Sounds like my kid. And water parks. Another anonymous user said the following. I am 26 years old. And when I was a child, someone close to me molested me. I shed tears reading your book. Thank you for your beautiful work. My flower has been wilted for years, but I have not forgotten about her. I am sharing the flower of my heart with you. Hami, meaning ally, supports Iran's 2.7 million drug addicts, not users, addicts. It provides the basic texts of Narcotics Anonymous, the location of recovery centers throughout the country, and emotionally and psychologically supportive content. With any tech team, design, development, adoption is hard work. For us, that's just the beginning. The Islamic Republic's cyber army is ruthless. We assume tampering with and blocking our, our apps as a matter of course. We implement security by design to protect all of our users. And for apps that are deemed particularly sensitive, we implement independent, we hire independent experts to implement security protocols and penetration testing. And yet, so far so good. We have had over 5.8 million page views over 378,000 downloads, and our apps have been used over 46,000 hours throughout the country. Our reach is one reason we believe in civic technology. Here are a few other ones. Human rights work is hard and dark. Our daily news is about executions and torture. We're often on the defensive, slowing down bad things from happening. Civic technology is allowing us to envision and create a new Iran, to be more proactive, to be more positive, and that's something that's rare and, and needed in our line of work. Iranians are young and they are educated. 70% of the country is under the age of 35 and 93% are literate. Women make up almost 70% of those studying science and technology in Iran. In order to sustain their independence, more and more women are choosing not to get married. In fact, 16% of those between the ages of 25 and 54, that's almost one out of six. 
Iranians are also global and liberal. During the last presidential election, during the last presidential election, 73% of those that were eligible voted, and of those, 57% voted for the more liberal candidates, the one that wants to open up Iran. Under this veneer of conservative, oppressive regime, we have a happy, hopeful population shining through. Our apps are the first that focus on human rights, civil liberties, and social welfare inside Iran. They are creating a platform for Iranians to express themselves, organize. And not only are Iranians running with it, they are dancing on it. I invite you, next time you hear Iran in the news, to think of these Iranians. This is last spring, after the election results were called. This is Iran. Thank you. <laughs>